Thanks, and good morning. This is a lovely passage. Um, I, I love how Paul uses this metaphor of the body. Um, it's both a metaphor and it's, and it's actually not metaphorical as well, in the sense that we really are the body of Christ on earth. Christ is no longer physically present here in, in his body on the earth, but we are doing his works. Um, but I want to start off this morning in verse five, because what Paul describes here could just be seen as, I don't know, good management or how to be nice to each other. And I want to make the case this morning that it's anchored in something much more important than that. There are different kinds of, sorry, there are different kinds of gifts. It's verse four and five, different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Paul usually uses God in uh, the sense of God the Father. And so here we have a Trinitarian declaration right at the beginning of what Paul's about to say. He anchors his argument in the Trinity. This is not simply human pragmatism. This is theological truth. You see, the Trinity explains that we have one God and only one God, but he exists in three persons. He is utterly one, utterly unified, and yet there is diversity within God. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is a mystery. It's supposed to be a mystery. But Paul says from, from that starting point, from this perfect example of what it is to be utterly one and yet to have diversity, out of that flows what he's about to explain. And what he goes on to explain is a really amazing view of unity. So what I want to start off with this morning is what is this unity that Paul talks about and what is it not? Because Paul talks about the unity of a body together. The first thing I want to say is that it's not what we call tolerance in our society. Tolerance is a word that's really gained popularity in Western societies in the recent times. And tolerance is really a pretty low bar, isn't it? Tolerance says we'll, we'll put up with each other even though we're different. If you like, it's sort of tolerance in spite or, or unity in spite of diversity. And one of the things that people celebrate about multiculturalism is that, you know, we, even though we're all different, we, we can put up with each other. The vision that Paul lays out here is, is something that goes far beyond that. So this is not tolerance that we're talking about. This is not putting up with each other. Nor in this particular passage is it about doctrinal diversity. Now, there are passages, both in this letter and in Romans particularly, about matters of conscience where there might be differences um, of opinion. And Paul goes into how we resolve those in love or, or don't even resolve them, but we continue to coexist with differing opinions in love. But that's also not what is in view here. This is not about diversity of thinking about whether other people's gifts have value either. It's the freedom for us all to have different gifts, not the freedom to look down on other gifts. I, I explain that briefly because this is something I've observed in a, in a number of different church cultures. I've been in churches where administrative gifts are seen as unspiritual if you like, um, the bureaucracy crowding out the room for God to move. I've seen uh, or heard comments where people have described encouragement as being woolly and not very spiritual because it lacks substance. Um, I've heard mercy givers being put down as being gushy. Um, and the thing that probably most of us have to struggle with here, uh, British cynicism, when somebody has a rise of faith and they uh, you know, that they have faith for something to, you know, break through or something big to happen. And the, the British cynicism rises up in us and says, oh, they're immature and naive. Now, that might actually be true sometimes, but there's, a, there's something in our national culture, I think, that, you know, if somebody bigs something up too much, we, we just assume that probably it's a bit overinflated. So what we're talking about here in this passage is not the freedom to, to be unified, but still to look down on other people's gifts. It's much, much better than any of those unities that we might talk about. This is a unity because of diversity. It's not we put up with each other because we, despite the fact we're different, it's we need each other to be complete. Hence Paul's choice of image. 
he's really, really specific in not only choosing the picture of the body of Christ, but actually laboring the point. He goes into more sort of detail and more examples of body imagery here than with pretty much any other image that he picks. The ESV study Bible, which has got fantastic study notes. If you're looking for a study Bible, top recommendation there. Their, their study notes here say this, therefore Paul wants the Corinthian church to understand how their unity can be enhanced by appreciating the variety of gifts God has given to them. We might think that actually unity is harder the more diversity there is. What, what the ESV study notes pick up on is that Paul is actually saying the opposite. He's saying, as we understand the full variety and as we accept the full variety of what God has given to us, our unity is enhanced. But Paul is clear to acknowledge that people might not feel that way. And he lays out these two different responses that we might have either I don't need you or I don't belong. Most of us probably have a tendency to, to go one way or the other on those when we come up with somebody who's very different from us. Either a sort of th those of us who struggle more with pride, and I'd probably put myself in this bracket, um, have a tendency to, to push away people who are not like us or who's, who's personality and character and gift we don't easily gel with and think we're, we're good without that thank you very much other people are much more self-deprecating and they would feel like actually because i'm not like that i don't belong um, and a classic one would be you know i i'm not a preacher i'm not musical i'm particularly on a sunday morning where those are some of the things that you see up front so you know i'm i'm really only just a participant a, a, um, a passenger in this congregation but actually, Paul says, no, that's not what it is. We're not a group of people who need to be homogenous. We're not supposed to be all the same. And we don't want to say we don't need other people who are different. We don't want to say we don't belong because we're different. Paul goes on to point out as well, it's the, it's the kind of diversity that cries out for more breadth. Now, if you go to your GP and they examine you, they're not going to say, look, you've got a great heart and you've got healthy legs and kidneys, but don't worry about the rest. That's great. You've got you've got good, good heart, good legs, good, good kidneys. No, they'll say, look, you need to take care of your liver and your eyes and your fingers and whatever else. And Paul's choice of picture points us communally as the body to seek to have strength in as many areas of the spirits working as we can. That makes us complete. So this picture of unity, and I'm going to labour this point because it's really important as a starting point for everything else. This picture of unity is not in spite of difference. This picture of unity is one that says we want difference. And in the sense that he's laying it out here in, in terms of diversity of gifting, we actually want as much difference, as much variety as we can, because that makes us complete as the body of Christ. And all of this is consistent with the following chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, where the giver is God who is love. And all of these gifts are to be exercised in love, seeking to build up the body. Now, we might all have some maturing to do in what I've just laid out there, but I doubt that there's going to be any controversy in saying that we should learn to appreciate and welcome people who are, I don't know, more gifted in wisdom or administration or faith. But that unity does get tested by some of the more controversial gifts. And so I'd like to really dig in there actually and, and talk this one out because this is, this is where the rubber hits the road for us as a community, I think. We've talked in a number of settings now about the fact that our vocabulary in particular can highlight and accentuate difference. Now there are genuine differences of theological opinion within our community and what I'm not trying to do is pretend that they don't exist. But what I'd like to do is to narrow down by by working a bit on our vocabulary, narrow down our perceived difference to what is actually different. And to do that, I'd like to pick two of the most controversial gifts that are listed in this passage. We didn't get as far as the, the second of them, but I'd like to talk about prophecy and I'd like to talk about apostleship. So prophecy, we've already picked up in that first list. If you keep reading down 1 Corinthians 12, you'll see that Paul then says, and you know, and God has placed in the church apostles and prophets and teachers, um, workers of miracles, gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, different kinds of tongues. And he goes on to say, look, do we all have that? No, absolutely not, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. What I'd like to do then is, is work through with these two gifts, 
what is it that I think we all believe? And I think having done that, that will leave us a much greater common ground from which to pursue this unity. Okay, so prophecy, let's start with that. First of all, let's all agree prophecy is not scripture. Not in the New Testament, not now. In the New Testament, there are some people who prophesy and it is recorded in scripture, but there are many, many more who don't. Just the fact that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and saying, when people prophesy, it should be like this, or don't too many people prophesy at once, indicates that there's a whole bunch of prophecy there that is not recorded as scripture. Likewise, Philip, the evangelist, has daughters who prophesy, but none of their prophecies are recorded in scripture. So even back in New Testament times, when somebody prophesied, it was not necessarily scripture. And that continues to be true. Whatever you think now of, of people saying, I feel like God is saying this, it is not scripture. We are not talking about adding to scripture. We have a closed canon of scripture. And this might sound totally obvious and it might sound like it just doesn't even need saying, but I think it is important to say, I'm aware that there are some um, perhaps extreme streams of church where people would say that things that are prophesied are added to scripture and carry equal weight. I think it would be fair to say that all of us in this setting are comfortable that, that the scripture is not going to be added to at any point. We have a closed canon of scripture to use the official term. The difficulty then comes with saying, well, it does, what, what status does prophecy have if it does happen today? Is it that you know, when God spoke in the scriptures, we had to do what he says, but now if he speaks, we, you know, it's like good advice. And I want to say, no, that's not the case because he's the Lord. What we're talking about here is about the reliability of transmission. So the first hand witnesses to Jesus testified that the things that were being written about Christ were true, that that was what he taught. Um, the church over 2000 years has testified these are the true scriptures. And if somebody gets up in a church the, in this day and age and says, I think God's saying this, it's not subject to that kind of scrutiny. It is not scripture. It's not that therefore God is just giving nice advice. It might absolutely be from the Lord. And if it is, we need to take it seriously. But it's not carrying the same um, reliability as scripture and therefore it cannot carry the same weight as scripture. The next thing I think we can all agree on is that God is speaking to people in our community in addition to through the scriptures. And we did a little show of hands um, a couple of weeks back when I last spoke. And rather frustratingly, because I was on the big screen, I just had a little strip down the side of, of thumbnails. I could only see a few people putting hands up. But pretty much everybody I've spoken to has said that they saw hands waving for pretty much everyone of the different ways that I listed. I, I think the only one was nobody waved a hand when I said, has anyone had a visit from an angel? And perhaps that's the one that I'm least surprised that nobody here has experienced. But we had people who would say that as they were praying, they had a strong sense that God was saying something. People who'd dreamed about something that they believe was God speaking to them. Uh, we had somebody uh, giving a testimony that they'd heard an audible voice of God at one stage. So this is happening in our community in diverse ways and we can all agree on that because I, I think we all trust each other enough to believe this isn't some kind of um, sort of delusion. I would probably call that or at least some of that prophecy you might not and in some ways I don't really mind what we call it. Either way it's not scripture and either way we'd do well to pay attention to it and weigh it for its value. If we do call it prophecy, we have some guidelines for how to use it. I haven't got time to go through 1 Corinthians 14 this morning as well, but it goes through how we should um, use the gifts, particularly of tongues and of prophecy, in a church context, in a way that builds the church up and in a way that is orderly and honours God. But we can all agree there's no new scriptures being written. We can all agree, I hope, that God is speaking to our community, to individuals, um, sometimes that will be for just them, but sometimes in a way that guides us as a community and that we should act on it in a way that honours God and honours each other. Now, that won't totally remove all of our differences. 
but pragmatically it should remove quite a lot of them if somebody in this community feels that god is um, speaking to them in a way that has a bearing not just on their lives but on us as a wider community it would be good for us to have a way to hear that to weigh it up so that we're being careful and then to respond it shouldn't be something where we just immediately say oh well look so and so said this so let's go and do it but it should push us to pray to talk to have conversations maybe to fast in some cases um, to consult with others and it should it should push us into a deeper relationship with God uh, into fervent asking and listening and the hope is that out of that we will end up moving forward um, in line with what God wants. I'm going to park prophecy there for a minute and I want to talk about this other one apostleship again a very controversial one the title itself, Apostle, is controversial, the fact that it gets used by some people today, um, although I have to say it's particularly common in uh, nations and cultures such as um, African ones. And as we engage with the global church, we, you know, you will find yourself engaging with people who would say, I am prophet, whatever, or I am apostle, whatever. And we need to be able to look them in the eye and engage with them as brothers and sisters. So it's probably helpful to have that kind of conversation as well. But again, can we can we establish what we do agree on? Whether or not you call anybody today an apostle or say they operate with an apostolic gift, nobody today has the honour that the original 12 had of being first-hand witnesses to Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. That's, a, that's an honour that was accorded originally to 12. Um, obviously, there were others who were first-hand witnesses. Judas fell away. Um, Matthias was appointed in his place. And they were called, you know, the 12, they had this unique status and, and nobody else gets to put themselves in that category. Likewise, nobody's teaching today has the authority or the infallibility of scripture. Now, actually, I would say that's not really a mark of an apostle anyway. Many of the apostles didn't write scripture. And some of the scriptures were not written by apostles. In fact, we're not even 100% sure who wrote the letter to the Hebrews. So what we're not saying is that anybody today would have that kind of authority or that kind of infallibility. But one of the difficulties we get when we unpack the New Testament is that language that was very everyday and commonplace in New Testament times, some of it has become church language nowadays. Apostle just means sent one. And every time that you read the word send in the New Testament, it's the same word as to apostle, if you like. And so we, we put capital A apostle in some situations in the scriptures and in other places we just say to send. And it makes it look as though it's sort of this thing that's only used in one particular way. But for instance, when Paul says, I sent Tychicus to Ephesus, 2 Timothy 4.15, it says, I apostled Tychicus to Ephesus. It was everyday language back then. I think we can probably all in this room, virtual room, agree that some people today do have a call of God on their lives to go and pioneer some new kingdom initiative, perhaps to plant a church, perhaps to start a particular ministry. We heard about Christians Against Poverty just now, and uh, the founder's name has gone out of my head, John somebody. Um, I've got his book up there, but I can't find it in, in time. But I would say personally that he, he had a call on his life to pioneer mission to the indebted and the poor. Now, whether you call it them an apostle or not, they have that, you know, they have that call to be sent and we can see that gift at work. And likewise, that gift also works itself out, certainly in Paul's case, in having an oversight um, and the, the, the sort of the position to correct and to bring correction and, and steering to local churches within a network of churches as well. So whether or not we call people apostles, I think we can see that gift at work today and we do well to, to welcome it and to accept it. And in fact, I, I believe we have already sent some people out and I suspect there will be opportunities to commission and send others out because we believe that that's the call of God on their life at some stage. I would love to really unpack every single one of these gifts. It would be a, a long, long talk and there's not time for it now. So 
as I say, my, my main intent was to take two of the most controversial ones, two of the ones that probably generate the most heat in a discussion across theological differences, and to say, I think there's a lot more common ground than perhaps we might sometimes think. And I believe as well that probably if we take the title out of it and simply talk about the, the substance, God guiding people and us responding well to that, God calling people to go and establish things and us responding to that, then we can we can welcome those gifts despite the theological differences that we have within the church. And we do well to welcome them because that's part of this full unity that God is leading us into. So what do we do with all of this? Well, I want to bring us back to um, this thing of unity that Paul started us off with. Because God is diverse and yet utterly one, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and yet utterly unified, he calls his bride to be like that as well. It won't do just to continue on in in sort of tolerance or um, the, that, that kind of low view of unity. We want to seek to have a full unity of all the things that God wants to give us. Some gifts in the church we already have in abundance. One of my first experiences of WCC was the interview day. Um, and as I understand it, it was all pulled together by Jane. Now, I've never had to run um, administration for multiple people being interviewed in someone's home. Thank you very much, Cyril and Jen, for putting your home up there um, and providing them all with refreshments and getting them around four different panels. But you know what? That was a gift of administration at work. That was not bureaucracy obstructing the work of the kingdom. That was administration enabling the work of the kingdom. I just give that example because it was one of my first experiences of WCC. I think we would say that we have a good um, a good abundance of the gift of administration, not only in Jane, but in others in the church. There are some gifts in this list and elsewhere in the scriptures that we don't have at all. I would dearly love to see gifts of healing at work in our church today, just as they are in some other places in the world. Now, in saying that, it's true that we have seen some miraculous healings, some of us, um, and sometimes with that immediacy of effect that Jesus's healings had. Um, I only have myself a smattering of stories and I think I've only personally been present at one where somebody prayed and immediately something was healed like that. But nevertheless, have seen miraculous answers to healing prayer. And I know that some of you have stories like that as well, but I would love to have somebody in our congregation or a few people in our congregation who had regular faith for that and who regularly saw people healed when they prayed. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in a country where the closest thing we have to a national religion is the NHS, and I say that without in any way denigrating the NHS, who are wonderful, but not God, wouldn't it be wonderful if people said, we've got a wonderful health service, but do you know what? If you can't fix it, you should go to church because there's a God in heaven who can. That story of Naaman, um, the, the Aramean commander, when he goes uh, his servant girl tells him that he can go to Israel and he'll get healed. And he turns up at the palace and the king says, I can't heal you. What are you talking about? And Elisha sends a message and says, tell him to come to me and he'll know that there's a God in heaven. I would love it if people came to church because they know that there is a God who intervenes in healing. Wouldn't that be amazing? Some gifts I think we do have, but we don't quite know what to do with them. Now, I want to include here this gift, whether or not you call it prophecy, the gift of hearing something quite clearly from God that is not necessarily just for you, but for, for somebody else or for the community. Um, perhaps how God's leading us, perhaps something that's coming soon that God wants us to know about, or perhaps something that needs to be addressed in our midst. And remembering that prophets didn't only speak about the future, but very often they spoke about issues within God's people that needed addressing. I think we do have some people in the congregation who already have some of that insight and that, that's part of their regular walk, but we're not quite sure what to do with it. Um, just an example that doesn't put anybody in this congregation on the spot. Um, a few years ago, Simon Jackman um, came along from Oxford Community Church. Andy O'Connell came to preach and Simon came with him. And 
uh, he had a, a, a picture as uh, he was praying of, uh, it was to do with plowing three furrows and it was to do with the level of activity that there was in the church. And we didn't quite know what to do with it as a fellowship. And I say, we, I, I wasn't there at the time. And as a result, that's, it's still sitting there on a tape recording somewhere, but it's not something that we have taken to heart uh, and talked about and, and done anything about. And I believe that if we do recognise this gift that some people seem to have been given of being able to hear quite clearly from God and see something that needs to be um, to be done and, and to step into it. I think if we receive that God-given insight, we'll see the quality of their gift. Jesus said in Matthew 10, it's 10 41, if you want to look it up, he said, whoever welcomes a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. There's that expression of faith in saying, I, I do believe that's from God and I do want to be obedient, that then brings the reward with it of, you know, of the reward of being obedient and seeing God at work. And all of this leads me back to a challenge that I brought to the fellowship in June 2019, before I was pastor here, of how we can receive these gifts as a church. It is difficult, um, but it won't do just to continue sort of pretending that they don't exist, or using them without the scriptural protections that we have on them, uh, ha have it happening in a corner in such a way that it's not publicly seen. Th those aren't good ways to deal with this gift or these gifts. And I want to suggest, and this is my, my closing point really, that there is a way forward for us as a community um, that has integrity, um, that is biblically sound, and that I want to commend to us. Paul finishes chapter 12 and starts chapter 14 with this statement here, I'll just, just read it. Eagerly desire the greater gifts, that's the end of chapter 12. And then he goes on to say, but, but desire to use them in love. And then starts off chapter 14. So follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. And he goes on to explain about the importance of gifts building up the church. I want to suggest that a really good response for us as a church would be to eagerly desire a breadth of gifts in our community. And what that means is even if you don't want a particular gift, and that's totally fine, you know, some people might just go, do you know what, never, ever, ever make me a teacher, please, Lord, no. Now, he might have a sense of humour and decide to give you that anyway. Uh, and there are people who say that kind of thing. But actually, it, it's not necessarily just about what you want for you. And that's that's not what this is about anyway. This is not a sort of um, a self-centered personality test type thing. But eagerly desire that our community would have great teachers. Eagerly desire that we as a community would have people working in gifts of healing. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be wonderful if people were showing up regularly on Sunday mornings because they met somebody who prayed for them and they were healed and they said, you know what, this was Jesus, come and find out more about him. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were people who, when we were sort of stuck of like, how do we even go back to church now? When is it, what should we plan for? Um, how can we plan for holiday club? And, you know, X, Y, and Z um, in this uncertain time, wouldn't it be great if there were some people who had conviction and said, you know what, I, I really feel like God is leading us in this way and we could take it and weigh it up. Now, even if you don't want that gift, wouldn't it be wonderful to pray that we as a community would have it? So the first part of this response is I want to encourage us to pray that God would give our community, our local church, a breadth of gifts, and particularly where we lack them at the moment. The second part of that is that we need to then use them scripturally in the way that we're told to. Examples just from this letter, weigh prophecies, in fact, not just from this letter, because weigh prophecies comes in Thessalonians, but weigh up prophecies. If somebody does feel like God's speaking to them in a way that guides us as a church, we shouldn't just take it and say, yes, absolutely, 100%. We need to weigh it. We need to pray about it. We need to talk about other with other people about it. Most importantly, we need to line it up with the scriptures and say, is this in line with God's character and his existing revealed word? For those who do speak in tongues, let's do it scripturally in a way that builds up the body or privately at home. 
for those who are seeking to uh, work in a gift of healing. Well, let's lay hands on people and maybe anoint with oil when we pray, because that's the way that we're encouraged to do it in scripture. Let's teach and encourage each other to use what we have in a way that builds up the church. Just in closing then, there is a risk, and I, I've alluded to this already, that in identifying our gifts, we might become us-centred. Um, there's also a risk that as we identify our gifts and our, our character, perhaps that God has given us, that we also use it as a cover for immaturity. You know, this is just how I am. Um, I'm grumpy because I'm a dot, dot, dot. Um, you know, I, I'm blunt because I'm a dot, dot, dot. And the antidote for that is for us to ensure that the focus of all of these things is God's glory and the strength and the beauty of his bride, the church. God's glory, the strength and beauty of the church. If we're seeking that, I think we won't become us centered. So let's respond in that way. Let's eagerly desire the fullness of gifts in our community. Let's seek to use them scripturally and let's honour each other um, by nurturing and receiving that breadth. We've done quite a lot of responding in, in quiet or corporate prayer. Uh, this week, we're not going to actually, Jemima's going to introduce a song just now that's a sung response to this. Um, we thought it'd be a different way to, to end this time. So I'm gonna hand it back to Jemima now to introduce this song. And hopefully this can be part of our response to this call. <laughs>